Welcome uh, this evening, everyone. Uh, appreciate you joining us uh, for the uh, Cooley House Fall Lecture for 2022. My name is Brian Davis. I'm Executive Director for the Board of the Cooley House Foundation in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, we've done this um, le free lecture series every fall for many years, thanks to the uh, sponsorship of the Gregory Stone family, the West Monroe, West Washita Chamber of Commerce, and the Louisiana Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as KEDM Public Radio. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we hope we're reaching, I know we've had uh, people sign up from uh, the UK to the US to Australia. So we're, we're spanning uh, three continents here uh, tonight to listen to uh, Glenda Corporal and learn more about Marion Mahoney Griffin who uh, was a fascinating person, and I think we'll, we'll even appreciate that even more after tonight's uh, talk, um, just as being one of the first uh, uh, women uh, licensed architects in the United States, uh, also the first employee of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, when he went at, uh, started his own office, uh, and as well as the second female graduate of the MIT School of Architecture. So um, she will uh, had a part in uh, part of the modifications to the Cooley House, uh, which we announced this week at a press conference has received a $483,500 grant for the, the Save America's Treasures program with the National Trust for his, uh, for the National Park Service. So we're excited. It's very exciting times. We will start uh, raising the uh, matching uh, funds to, to get that grant. Uh, so uh, your membership, your donations, any of that all counts toward the match. Uh, we appreciate all that support and follow us along the route as way, uh, the, along the, the project as well. Because uh, we really want to have the Cooley House uh, be a learning tool for us as we go through the true restoration of it, uh, the way that it needs to be restored. Uh, so now we're going to uh, turn it over to Glenda Corporal, who's an Australian uh, journalist who has worked a lot in, in financial journalism, uh, but also and lived in the United States for a while, uh, but also wrote um, the book uh, Marion's Biography, uh, which you may have a copy of here. So finding uh, uh, finding Marion. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Glenda, let you uh, fill in spaces that I left uh, open for, for your itch, for your bio, but also uh, to pass the mic to you. Thank you, Glenda. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for um, inviting me. And I'm, um, I'm constantly amazed how the group and still, here we are in 2022, and, and it, they're still bringing people together from all over the world and around the, uh, around the country. So um, anyway, I'm hoping to, I got very fascinated by Marion, um, end up writing the only biography of her. Um, and I'm just hoping to share a bit of my passion, uh, passion with, um, for Marion with, with you. And I, I must say, I congratulate you on, on the, the years of work that you've done and um, that you've been able to get uh, uh, a grant to go to the next stage. So um, now, let me just check, how's that going? Uh, and from beginning, yes. Is that right? Right, okay. Um, can you uh, see the, um, the presentation now? Yes, okay. All right. Yes, we can. Um, Thank you. Yes, okay, great. All right. Um, the, one of the points I would like to make is, is putting Marion Marnie or Mayani Griffin, as she called herself, um, in, in a broader uh, a broader context. I call it the Prairie School di diaspora. You might call it something different, but she was part of a broader movement. She's obviously a very unusual woman, uh, but the the Walter Burley Griffin, Frank Lloyd Wright, the other architects in that school were part of a very interesting period of American history. Um, now, and, and in, in this picture here, um, I've got Marion um, pictured between Walter and, and Frank Lloyd Wright, who are the two um, perhaps most influential men in, in her life. Um, now, Marion was born in Chicago in uh, 1871. Uh, so um, now she was, um, her grandparents uh, migrate, were part of the great movement West. They came from New England. Um, when the Midwest was opening up, they migrated to the town of Tremont. Her grandfather was a, a doctor um, and they, uh, uh, and in my research on Marion, I as she she refers to in Magic of America that her grandparents, the Perkins, were friends of Lincoln. And, and anyway, I um, long story short, uh, I found out that Lincoln in the 1850s was a lawyer in Springfield, the capital, and he would go um, a, a, every sort of twice a year, I think, the lawyers and the judges would do a county circuit. 
uh, and they would visit Tremont. And, and Marion's uh, grandfather being the, the, the town doctor was, was quite a big shot and he would have everyone over. But uh, the reason I'm also, I suppose, talking about the links with Lincoln is there's, there's an ideology that Marion has, um, a, a sort of, I think, a social justice ideology that, that came through. I mean, um, it was her mother who was, um, uh, it was a, well, through the Perkins line was connection there. Um, so um, the Perkins, uh, Marion's mum uh, went to Chicago. She became a teacher. Um, so Marion was born in February um, on Valentine's Day. Um, and she was born um, a few months, when she was eight months old, they had the great fire of Chicago. Now, this um, devastated Chicago. Um, a lot of people were killed um, and, uh, and the large chunks of the city were burnt to the ground. Um, Marion's parents decided that Chicago was, you know, really no place to bring up a young family. She had an older brother and they moved north to um, a place called in, in the Evanston area, um, north of Chicago along the lake. And so Marion grew up there. Um, and this is, uh, she grew up as, as a, um, as not a wild, but she was able to um, roam free. So on the one side, she's got the lake and the other side, she had the Skokie River. And I love some of Marion's writing. I think it's very rich and, and um, clear. She's talking about growing up next to a ravine. You could walk to the forest. You could go to the shores of Lake Michigan. But you can see in here the joys. She said the marvel of the lake, the joys and the delight of summer. And she's describing um, summer or winter. So this to me shows Marion the environmentalist, that she loved the outdoors. Um, she always would say she was she wanted to be outside, never inside. But it's, it's appreciation for the environment that she's had in that um, growing up as a young girl, lots of freedom um, and, um, uh, and really loving uh, the outdoors and the environment. Now, Marion's cousin um, was Dwight Perkins. Now, they both share the same grandparents. Dwight's um, father um, was uh, a very um, inspired by, um, by Lincoln. He actually, at one point, had a lock of Lincoln's hair. He went to fight in the Civil War, um, and, and he ended up dying when Dwight was quite young, and Dwight then had to go out to work. Uh, but um, so again, Dwight himself, I think, is, is linked with what I would call perhaps the social justice um, influence of people who were supporters of Lincoln. Um, now, we don't know why Marion's parents were both teachers. Um, it, it would have been pretty normal for her to be a teacher. She was obviously a good student. She was very well read. Uh, but her uh, older cousin, Dwight, um, grew up also playing with her in that area north of Chicago. She was very close. Dwight um, had a strong social justice view of what an architect would do. And it was not about necessarily building grand buildings. It was about designing cities um, and, and having areas where children could play, having parks, um, having well-designed houses and space that, that ordinary people could live in, not just, um, uh, you know, grand buildings and things like that. And so um, Dwight, um, with some help from some a wealthy women in Chicago, was financed to go to MIT. And I believe that he inspired her to go. So uh, Marion went, um, you know, she was a pretty self-confident woman. Um, she wasn't intimidated about being one of the first women studying architecture um, there. In fact, if anything, in her writings, um, the, the most interesting thing was that she came from the Midwest and then they asked her, you know, did she have an Indian blood? And, and so in a way, her oddity was coming from the Midwest, um, but she did a four year degree. She was the second woman um, in, to do the four year degree uh, at MIT in architecture. The first woman, Sophia Hayden, could not get work and she ended up uh, being a teacher. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so um, going to Chicago of the time, Chicago was a very wealthy city. It was a very rich city and it was a city rebuilding itself. And there was a movement in Chicago at the time, originally perhaps inspired by Louis Sullivan, who was saying, we want to have an American architecture. We don't want the architecture of the East Coast, which is imported from Europe. 
Um, we're Americans, let us develop our own architecture. So this was this kind of philosophy that Louis Sullivan had. Um, now, uh, and you can see in some of his work there, um, a little bit of um, uh, arts and crafts there, but the, again, environment, the outdoors, perhaps coming into some of his design. Now, this is completely different to um, Louis Sullivan. Uh, Daniel Burnham designed the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Chicago got this because they, were, they bid for it um, and they were seen, they were about the second or third largest city in, in, in the America. Um, but uh, this, this is a more classical kind of design, but what this is about the people of Chicago discussing the design of cities and, and perhaps also how you use the water, um, grand cities. And there was a lot of debate. Um, I remember, I can't remember exact time, like 1880s, 90s, when uh, Baron von Haussmann was redesigning Paris. So in Chicago, there was debates about, well, how do you build grand cities? And what, uh, so this is the kind of architecture is not something the Griffins would have liked, but it's symbolic of perhaps the feeling in Chicago of discussing art and architecture. Now, when Marion went, um, when Marion came back to Chicago, she was very, very lucky. And she ad admits it herself that, well, a lot of women could not have got work. She worked for her cousin Dwight, um, who was a few years older than her and he was more established. Um, and he gave her her job or she worked, they were currently working on the Steinway Hall building. Um, it, it's still in downtown Chicago. And up the top, uh, Dwight designed a sort of a loft area, very um, lots of light. Uh, and um, that became a haven for uh, architects, a lot of architects to come. And a lot of his friends moved in, like-minded friends, and certainly Frank Lloyd Wright worked there for a while. So the top part of um, Steinway Hall became a little sort of campus of like-minded young architects who were following Louis Sullivan, um, interested in arts and crafts, interested in the environment. Um, and so Marion actually worked on the obviously as a junior architect, but she worked on um, as, as a, um, she worked on that project. Um, now, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was to work in, in there. She met Frank Lloyd Wright. He was part of a broader Unitarian church group that Marion was part of. Um, so Frank Lloyd Wright worked there, but he was, he had a house in Oak Park. Um, his family was growing and he decided to um, set up an office um, next to his house adjoining to his house, and I'm sure um, quite a few have actually been to see this. One thing you'll note, the entrance to the house is around the corner to the entrance to the office. And this was meant to have two separate, to separate the office and the house. Uh, and Marion, uh, I'm told, uh, helped, she didn't, she helped design these, this entrance to the house and they're seen as two, um, two stalks. The actual uh, work was done by sculptor Richard um, Bock. But so when um, Wright moved out to Oak Park, Marion moved, uh, moved out with him. Um, now, this is the studio at Oak Park, um, which has been redone and you can see it today. And this was where, um, when I did that tour, that I first heard of Marion and they said, well, she worked here. This is, um, and, and it was when it first of all became, you know, um, a little bit of a, um, a germ um, a, a, in my thinking, and I obviously began to uh, uh, become more interested in her. Now, Walter Burley Griffin um, is to remember, he's five years younger than Marion and probably about eight years younger than Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, he finished his degree in 1899. He worked for a while with um, um, Dwight Perkins. So he's affected by Dwight Perkins thinking. And then um, he get, becomes a licensed architect and joins um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. And 1901, he becomes part of that um, Wright studio. And that's where, um, anyway. Now, this is the photo that I, I like because a lot of people find it quite striking. This shows to me how close Marion was to the Frank Lloyd, the Wright, Lloyd Wright family. Um, I was told, and this is in the Frank Lloyd Wright archives, this picture, um, that, Ma that Frank Lloyd Wright, who was fascinated by cameras, took that picture. Um, to me, it shows the closeness of Marion. Um, she's there on the left with Kitty Wright. Uh, Kitty Wright, 
uh, was married when she was about 17 and ended up having um, six children. She wasn't a professional woman. And I'm thinking that what Wright might be thinking, she, he's meeting Marion, who was a professional woman. And I wondered whether he's somehow seeing the two, um, two focuses of the woman, wife and mother and woman as this professional woman that he's seeing in Marion. Um, one of the houses that they were working on in the right, um, in the right office around 1902 was the Dana House. Um, I've just thrown that in there because I think there's some similarities with the Cooley House. Um, Marion was doing some work on it. I think she worked perhaps on the stained glass windows. Um, now, as Marion started to work for Wright, he could see she was a very good drawer. And so he pushed her in and she, uh, you know, encouraged her um, into drawing some of his designs. And his designs were striking, they were original, they were different, they were sort of more ge ge geometrical. And you can see Marion's hand in, in this drawing, um, which has put has set the um, house in the trees and they've got these hanging vines. So it's her passion for the environment and trees uh, and, you, and you can see this signature style evolving in her drawing, but Wright could see she was a good drawer. But part of, um, you know, this is way, way before um, all sorts of um, um, modern media we have, drawings of houses were one way to sell that house to the, to sell the house to the client. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright allowed uh, people who worked for him to do other commissions. And this was Marion's first independent commission. Um, it was the Unity Church in Evanston, Illinois. Um, sadly, it was torn down um, and it's a parking lot. Um, and this wasn't her first design. But anyway, what you can see um, in this church, you've got the mural at the back. You've got stained glass windows at the top, letting the light in um, and, and making this very connected to the outdoors. And see the two on either side of the pillars um, you'll see these sort of vertical boxes which allow for hanging vines. So you'll start to see the hanging vines as being a bit of a Marion signature. Um, another, this is the Darwin Martin House in Buffalo, which I saw earlier this year. Um, I'm only showing it to you. I don't think Marion had much to do with it, but it was being done in the right um, studio around 1903, 1904. So um, it just gives you a little bit of a sense of the kind of architecture coming out of Wright's office at that time. Now, 1905, um, there, uh, Wright um, had been fascinated by Japan. And after the opening up of Japan um, in the late 1800s, there was a lot of fascination with Japanese art. Um, you'll recall the Impressionists um, were very interested. There's a Van Gogh. Um, painting of a uh, Japanese woodblock. Um, and Wright went, uh, he took three months, he went with his wife and uh, a client, they went to Japan for three months. And he came back with armloads and armloads of Japanese prints. And they were hung up all around the world, uh, all around the wall rather. Um, I think that the Japanese art had a, um, an appeal to the modern people of the day because it was fresh, um, it was simple, it wasn't like overly cluttered with classical lines, uh, but there, it's also the environment. I mean, you see the Mount Fuji there, you see the rain, ordinary people in the environment. So this was quite significant in the right studio. Um, and it started to infuse, Marion, um, uh, Marion's drawing started to be infused with a Japanese style. Um, Unity Temple uh, was something that, Wright worked on the original church in Oak Park had burnt down. Um, the church people did not have a lot of money um, and Wright wanted to build it in concrete and obviously concrete having um, fireproof um, um, uh, properties. Uh, but this is a very unusual design for a church, obviously. Um, and so and Wright um, had to sell this church design to, um, to the church elders. And so this is a beautiful drawing that Marion did of it. And I think she's trying to um, soften some of the uh, harder lines, but you've got her hanging vines, you've got her um, trees around it. And I believe that again, some of her drawings will help, help to sell this idea to, um, uh, to the elders of the church. 
Now, this is a quite a famous drawing in Marion's history because um, you're starting to see Marion's style. So it was a Frank Lloyd Wright designed house, uh, but Marion's putting more and more of her um, uh, of her trees around it. And you can see down the bottom left-hand corner, there's a little bird. And I don't know whether you can see it, but right underneath the trees, there's an, a little spider and it's MLM, Marion Lucy Marnie. And this is the first time that she put her name or, or her um, uh, monogram onto, onto a drawing. Um, and Wright, um, Wright, of course, was an egotistical man and never admitted that anyone did anything in his office except him. But he, when he saw this drawing, he picked up a pen and he wrote a drawing by Marnie um, after Frank Lloyd Wright and Hiroji, the Japanese um, artist. So it's the first acknowledgement by him of her being affected or inspired by the Japanese style. Now, Wright um, was approached by a publisher in Germany called uh, Herr Wasmuth. Um, and Wasmuth was in, interested in Wright's unusual designs, and he asked him to put together a portfolio of his designs to you know, show, show the world. Um, and so Wright in 1909 went to Europe to help put together this portfolio. Uh, but of course, as we all know, um, um, to the shock of his wife, um, he was actually also running off with the wife of a client. Um, so this was a sort of great scandal. Um, and the scandal um, is important in a number of ways because it effectively closed that Oak Park office. Um, so that little campus or university there uh, closed, Marion moved out. Uh, but um, just on the subject of the Wasmuth portfolio, uh, when people study it, about half of the, it was like more than 100 drawings, half of them were done by Marion. Um, they were redone and whatever, but these, I'm just showing two here, the Harding House is in Racine, Wisconsin, and, and this other house that you've, I've showed you before, the uh, KC de Rhodes House. So um, people have looked at the Vazmuth portfolio. I think you can get copies in Frank Lloyd Wright gift shops, um, but people have said like at least half were done by Marion, but of course was not acknowledged. Uh, now, this is the um, Peters House in Chicago done by Griffin. And now the other fallout of this Japan trip was Wright had borrowed all this money off Walter to go on the trip. And when he came back, he didn't have the money to pay for it, to, to repay him. And um, long story short, and they had lots of other disputes. Um, Wright went out on his, uh, sorry, Frank um, Griffin went out on his own, moved into back into Steinway Hall. And this was one of the first things he worked on. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're starting to see some little overtones of, uh, of, um, of your, um, the cooling house there in those sort of windows. Um, Marion, uh, anyway, um, long story short, Marion, after the scandal of uh, Wright going off, moves also back to um, work in Steinway Hall. Um, and there she meets Walter um, and they eventually marry in 1911. Um, and one of the things they continued to work on, um, uh, she worked on was the continued design of the, of the Cooley House. Um, so I, I think this, uh, now a number of things about this drawing, um, just see the white paint, her use of white paint to highlight. Um, you can see the Marion style now. It's not just, it's a drawing which sells that house to you. It talks about the floor plan, but it's got it set in a beautiful environment. So it's got a, a real Marian touch, touch on it, touch to it. Um, just before she married um, Walter, she was working on some projects uh, in Steinway Hall. They, the clients had originally come through Wright and Wright wasn't there, so she had to finish it. Um, and so this, this is in um, Decatur. Um, and I think it's, so this was her, before she married Walter, but after she left Wright, or Wright left her. Um, but this to me is one of the best houses Marion um, Marian has designed. It's, it's you know, Marion's signature, beautiful stained glass windows, lovely light coming through. So um, that's, um, that's one of my favorites. Another thing that uh, she did, and this was never built, but she did do a, um, um, Henry Ford had come into the Wright office before Wright left, 
um, and she worked on a drawing of the house. It wasn't built um, largely because uh, Mrs. Ford uh, decided to build some kind of English Tudor house. But um, now, the um, when the um, Griffiths married, uh, they started to work on a project in Mason City, Iowa. Now, Wright had already been working there, and he'd built a um, a house. And Marion, I think, worked on this as well in his office. And this has been redesigned. And if you do get a chance to go to Mason City, you can stay in that hotel. It's really, it's been beautifully redesigned. But um, so Marion had links with Mason City. And then after Wright was, um, Wright when he came back was, was persona non grata. A lot of people didn't want to deal with him, a lot of former clients. Uh, and Marion had some links with Mason City, Iowa. And so the Griffins were, were brought in uh, by some local people who wanted to, uh, and they started design a little precinct around the um, around the um, uh, Willow Creek there. And this was Marion designing her vision for there was to be houses either side of the creek. Um, you can see some Japanese inspiration. Um, you can see how the houses are nestled into the environment. It's not just houses; it's houses that fit into the environment. Um, now, this is a Marian drawing. Now, see the vertical Japanese scrolls, um, like, um, and this was particularly the Melson house, which was made of sandstone. And we, um, we believe Marian liked um, this um, Joshua Melson. He was a bit of a character. And uh, there were quite a number of other houses built, but we feel this is Marian's got Marian's um, uh, touch in, in the house and definitely in the drawings. Now, um, 1911, after the Griffins got married, um, there was a contest uh, as, as the Australian States had federated in 1901, and the, uh, there was a call for a design plant, a design plan for the city of Canberra, which was sort of roughly in the middle of nowhere. It's now about four hours drive south of Sydney, but it was sort of not much there except a river. Anyway, Marion really pushed Walter to take this opportunity uh, because there had been this interest in Chicago in the design of cities and how you design cities, good cities, and how you, uh, what you do with rivers and things like that. So um, this was the, um, uh, one of the bird's eye views of the plan, which uh, I won't go into great detail, but it's talking about the damming of the river and turning it into lakes and their buildings uh, either side, but it was very sort of modern uh, modern idea for a city. Um, now, Miles Franklin is an Australian writer who happened to be living in Chicago at the time, um, and she was part of the women's trade movement, trade union movement there. But she got to know the Griffins after they won the plan, uh, although their plan was um, awarded first prize. And she described the feeling that the Griffins had in designing this city. And um, you can see this sense of democracy, this sense of seeing Australia where women had the vote. Um, and there was a number of other, um, perhaps more social justice issues. We had a bit of a minimal wage. Um, and, but this idealism that the Griffins both had of um, a new democracy, um, a country where maybe you could start with a blank sheet of paper and not have the mistakes of old. Um, and so this was sort of the ideology that the Griffins both had as they're designing this plan for Canberra. Um, at the same time, obviously, hoping that um, Captain Cooley would also get his house built. But anyway, um, so I'll just quickly go through some of the actual details. Marion did a lot of the drawings um, of the plan for Canberra. Again, I've mentioned the white paint before. That white paint was... Um, something that Marion used as a highlighter and it's very um, effective. Um, so you see the city on the lake um, and her, their plans for buildings. Um, and this is a close up of their plan for the capital, a capital building, the parliament building. Um, and Marion, her last drawing was this sort of um, triptych. It was quite large and it had to be sort of folded up. Um, and it was we call it the view from the summit of Mount Ainsley. And this was their vision of the Canberra, the city nestled into the environment. Um, and I feel it's got a lot of inspiration also from um, Japanese, um, Japanese art. And um, I think there's almost a little Mount Fuji figure um, in the background. 
uh, and I believe this is what sold the um, the plan to the to the judges um, in Australia. And um, so here we are in 1912 in Melbourne, which was the sort of temporary capital of Australia. And these are the um, this was the day in May 1912 where they announced that Griffins had won first prize. Um, and this was a, um, a press gathering. Um, and one of the men at the back is Keith Murdoch, who's Rupert Murdoch's father. So anyway, that's a little bit of a um, uh, history there. The interesting, the guy at the front is called King O'Malley, and he was born in America. He was a um, Minister for Home Affairs. Uh, and interestingly enough, as, as an American born, he wasn't actually allowed to stand for parliament. Um, and so he migrated to Australia and I, he, he made up this story that he was actually, his mum had gone to Canada when he was born or something like that. But he's quite a character. He came to befriend the Griffins. Um, so Walter, in 1913, came out to Australia for a, a, a visit. And um, at that time, Marion is working on the cooling house designs. So um, not, they didn't move till 1914, but, um, you know, and I, I'm loath to overstate Marion's role. It's very hard when you study the Griffins to work out who did what, and they were a very husband and wife team. Um, but uh, definitely in Magic of America, she writes when Walter's, Walter went in 1913 first on his own. And she says to him, we are, we are um, working on the sketches for the Munro house. Um, this is 1913. Um, we returned them saying, go ahead with the working drawing. So at that point, they didn't know, 1913, they didn't know they were going to go to Australia. Um, and they were probably hoping to um, build the Curley house. So Marion was working on the drawings. Now, you know, uh, how she influenced them. Uh, what influence she had, I, I, I just don't like to say what I, what I sort of don't know. Um, anyway, they moved to Australia in 1914, um, and this was um, Sydney Harbour then. We didn't have our bridge till 1932. Um, and then the Griffins decided, um, even though the capital was in Melbourne, that they really loved Sydney, and they bought some land, um, and they, um, uh, they had designed a house for there. Um, you see a change in, in the building style and the design that Walter's doing now. It's more um, lock looking, um, fitting into the environment. They eventually had to move to Melbourne because that was really where Walter's job was. Um, but they had a practice on the side and there was a cafe. Uh, there was a Greek Australian who wanted to uh, had a cafe, but he wanted to have it redesigned. And while um, this just came out of the Walter practice, you can see Marion's hand all over this because it's so much like her church. Um, you've got the light coming in from the top. You've got the mural at the back. Um, you've got um, the, the, fir, the um, fern trees. This sort of getting the environment back into this building. So this is to me very Marion. Um, and this is the inside uh, one of the rooms there. And Marion designed the chairs. And if you look, there's a um, uh, another layer of the chairs underneath, which um, we believe is um, Marion design, so women could um, put their handbags there, which I think is very sensible. Um, another thing that the Griffins worked on while they were in Melbourne, we're about into 1917 here, was Newman College. And this was a Catholic college for the University of Melbourne. Um, and Griffin had quite an unusual um, uh, design. It was sort of perhaps a bit maybe Southern European. I mean, that reminds me a little bit of Barcelona at the top. So Marion, here's Marion in his office doing the drawings, uh, selling this unusual design as she'd done for Frank Lloyd Wright, as she'd done for the plan for Canberra. Um, and you can see her uh, um, obsession or, or passion for, um, for the trees. And, and this is the actual, um, that is still um, uh, in, in Melbourne today. Um, you can start to see a little bit of change in, in Walter's design style, use of sandstone, um, use of voussoirs. Um, so as he moves into Australia, he, he design um, changes from perhaps more traditional prairie school. Now, Marion um, was, um, Marian, um, was unable to really practice architecture in in, in Australia. In Australia, she became Mrs. Griffin. 
Um, she was um, worked with Walter, but she in a way became slightly frustrated and she really got interested in Australian plants and trees. And she really started to do these beautiful drawings, Japanese scroll-like drawings. Uh, and, um, uh, and they were done on silk. Um, and so these, um, they would, she would draw them and um, they were painted on silk. Um, and these, um, a number of them, we call them the forest portraits. Uh, and there was a book, there was a, at the Block Museum um, in Evanston, uh, at Northwestern University, there was a, a um, exhibition or a, a seminar on them. And there's a book called Drawing in the Form of Nature, which um, um, she not only has her drawings, but her descriptions of the Australian plants and trees. Um, this is a house that the Griffins lived in in Melbourne. You see them um, liking uh, being outdoors. Um, and um, Walter eventually um, got um, had there was long politics in the in the design of Canberra and the building of it. The First World War got in the way. Um, he also had an anti. He didn't believe Australia should participate in the war. Um, the government of the day clearly did. Um, anyway, by 1920, he they he went out on his own and, and fully devoted himself to his practice. And one of the buildings they both worked on it was a very um, ambitious building. Uh, it was called the Capitol Theatre. So it was an office block with a theatre underneath. Now, uh, that's a Marion's design there, but you can see there's uh, overtones of Steinway Hall. This was a massive project and um, the Griffins had not been back to it, to America, um, but it was at the end of this uh, that they finally said, well, let's, um, you know, let's go and make a trip back home. Um, and Henry Pinor, who had worked with the Griffins in Melbourne was living in, um, was working in Chicago for the time. And as you know, this is when Walter came back and um, reconnected and uh, said, you know, began uh, uh, commissioning Pine, go, going down to, um, to Munro and, um, and getting going on the building of the house, which, um, uh, and, and you'll see here some of the overtones in some of the previous buildings. So. Um, the Griffins went back to Australia, but Henry Pinor um, oversaw um, the construction of, uh, of this to their design. Um, that's some interior shots. Note the windows, I'll talk about them a little bit later. Um, now, um, I'm not gonna go into the history of Henry Pinor. It was something he did later in Sydney. The only reason I'm showing you this is because it's very, it's not a, it's, he has his own style. What he did with the Cooley house was what Walter wanted, not particularly what he he would have wanted. Um, now, in preparing this, I um, I started to think about. I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but it might be something to think about the the literal parallels between the top is the Dana House in Springfield, the second one is the Moolah House that Marion did in, in Decatur, and the third one is the Cooley House. So you can see there's sort of overtones. Um, if you say the Cooley House is 1908, um, the Dana House is 1902-03, um, the other one is 19, about 11. Um, so I, anyway, I think there's similar themes there that, um, and again, if I'm making this argument of this broader prairie school diaspora, um, you can see some of the themes of that time. Anyway, the Griffins come back to Australia um, they moved back to Sydney and they bought um, some land. Uh, they, there was a consortium bought some land at Castle Crag, uh, which they loved because it was on the, har on the um, harbour. Um, the Griffins could canoe there and they had done that in Chicago together. And they began to set up a little community. Uh, this was um, what it looked like when they bought the land. And these were the kind of houses that they designed so very different to the Cooley House. You can see the evolution of Walter's designs uh, made of the natural sandstone, um, flat roofs, um, and very much designed to get the view of the water. Um, uh, and Marion's drawing on the left, the use of uh, voussoirs, sandstone, setting the uh, community in the, um, in the landscape. Uh, they actually planted lots and lots of Australian trees um, and this was a house that the Griffins lived in. Now, um, they, um, in Castle Crag, 
Now, this is um, a video of Castle Crag about 1928. Um, and you can see the view. Now, this is Marion. She cut her hair. She's entertaining these visiting ladies who've come to see this unusual community and houses. And she's trying to sell them. I mean, she wants them to buy or commission houses. The houses are unusual. Um, you can see the flat roof there. You can see lots of, it's not that, the garden's not that well developed. So these ladies were, um, were driven up uh, from Sydney by, um, I think, this guy, um, who's obviously not so interested in the morning tea. Um, now, the houses had flat roofs, and they would have parties on it. And this is a, a New Year's Eve party, because um, it's summer in um, Australia then. This, you can see the community that they were building, and what an unusual, what an unusual house. Um, a house they were. Now this is um, the the Griffins in the garden. Um, her, his father came out to um, his father came out to uh, uh, to visit them, um, and that Marion was very much interested in building a community. And she the she married when she was forty. Um, she was very fond of children. Whether they could have children or not, I I don't know. But they didn't have children. But she was very much building up a local community. Um, and they'd have lots of children's birthday parties, Christmas parties. Now, um, Michael Thompson, who gave you, a, I think, a lecture or a talk a couple of years ago, put this together. Um, and again, I won't go into a lot of detail, but look at the signature. I believe that Walter, and this is more Walter than Marion, um, used um, Muntins to have personal or individual signatures in, in the windows of the houses. Um, and all of these are castle crag houses uh, but again that might be something that as you um, rebuild your house that you can look at how Walter um, used these sort of signature um, you put his signature on different houses with different window designs the house on the right the Fishwick house is up for sale for six million dollars at the moment um, the Griffins um, it, it's the 30s it's the depression life wasn't there wasn't that much economic activity going on in Australia, the Griffins had a chance to go to India. And, and so about 1935, 36, he went first, she went afterwards, they went to India. So you could say that the Prairie School diaspora, um, you know, spread to Lucknow where they were. That was one of the things that they worked on. Um, there was this other thing called, the, it was a newspaper building, Pioneer Press, a Marian design. You can see the white paint. You can see her um, signature flowers. Walter very sadly died in 1937 and he's buried there. Um, I went there a few years ago. Um, he's sort of buried on his own in a sort of European cemetery. Marion was absolutely devastated and she comes back to Australia but goes back to Chicago. We're now talking about 1937, 38. Um, I don't know that she meant to ever never return to Australia but World War II happened. Marion got back and saw Frank Lloyd Wright being very famous um, and they'd had shoots. There was very bad falling out between her and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, but she wanted to tell the world what she and Walter, what Walter had done. Um, and she wrote this, um, it's now uploaded on, on a website called Magic of America. It was never published in her time. And it's quite, it's a bit higgledy-piggledy. It's a bit hard to read, but um, it's, you can search it online. And so, Part of Marion's legacy is her recording of what they did together, as well as her own work. Um, just getting back to Wright, I mean, Wright obviously became very famous. Um, he died in 1959. Um, this was his last building. You can see his style evolving. Um, it evolved a lot over his many years. Um, uh, and, and in 1961, Marion died. Um, she had been very poor. She was living with her granddaughter. Um, she's buried in, or her, uh, this plaque is in um, the, the cemetery in Chicago, uh, but she was not very well known then and she died. Um, uh, she died penniless and unknown. Now, um, so I'm, I'm coming back to now um, and I'm just showing you, this was again the, the design that Marion did for Canberra. And, and this is what it looks like now. And this is, the, this is the view from the summit of Mount Ainsley. You can go and see it now. Um, which is pretty amazing given they'd never been to Australia. 
And they, the view from the summit of Mount Ainsley was recently called Marion Marnie View. Um, another legacy of the Griffins, the National Arboretum, which had been in their plan, um, was a couple of years ago in Canberra, they set aside some space and um, you can visit this. So it's very beautifully done. Um, my interest in Marion eventually saw me write um, her, um, her biography, but I, to explain who she was, I had to put her in the context of Wright and Walter and I called it Making Magic Out of Magic of America. Now, um, coming back to, um, I'll be finishing in a second. Um, these are two um, part pieces of stained glass window from that church, um, the church she designed. By some miracle, they've been preserved. Last year, the Art Institute of Chicago bought the one in the middle. Um, it was about like $100,000. Um, and I was instrumental, the, the one on the side, um, I heard that come up for sale and I was instrumental. The National Gallery of Victoria bought that for a similar amount. Um, so in a way, it sort of shows that here we are in 2002, there's still an interest in Marion. Um, and also, again, going back to your, you know, I really congratulate you all the work that you've been doing to keep, um, um, to, um, to renovate and restore that really interesting house, which I think, I suppose the point is this, um, I can't tell you exactly what Marion's role was in it, uh, but, I think it's just part of broad, very interesting part of history, um, of American history of these really interesting people who did come out of Chicago around, around that time. So I will um, stop there and I will um, see if you have any questions. I'll turn that off, yeah. Or should we go back to the show? No, it's great. Thank you so much, uh, Gwenda. That's, that's fascinating. And I know that, um, you know, Walter Burley Griffin, one of his, um, Especially areas was actually landscape architecture too. So that was one thing that their, their uh, common interest, even uh, before they they started dating and and got married, uh, whether they both had a love for the environment and for landscape uh, architecture and and the natural environment as well as kind of um, you know I guess much along the the lines of um, Frank Lloyd Wright later took that into uh, his later designs after they had left the office with falling water and they're like that. But it's that, it's that whole mentality, this whole, whole group of, of architects of that age uh, were really looking at new ways of instead of mowing everything down, they were trying to incorporate it and, and appreciate that natural beauty. Yes, Walter originally actually wanted to study land, landscape architecture. He wanted to be a landscape architect before it, and I think he was inspired by people like um, Olmsted uh, who designed uh, Central Park, and he also was involved in um, the design of the Chicago Fair, um, and uh, and there were others. So yeah, this the whole the um, the landscape architecture and the fitting the house in the in the environment rather than uh, you know the the integration with nature was something they were both very um, empathetic with. Yes, one of the questions we have. Um... Uh, from John is uh, few, so few of her drawings were signed by her. Um, I guess you kind of talk about um, that. Um, uh, her, you know, at what what point was she comfortable in signing or able to sign uh, in the shadow of of Wright? I guess her later works with with Walter would have obviously been been signed with her monogram, uh, if not other otherwise. Yes, yes. Um, it, it is interesting. That was why that particular drawing of about 190, I think it's 1908, was so important that she had the confidence to put her monogram on it, uh, because Wright was a very dominating character and uh, certainly really, you know, was he wasn't promoting of his other architects. Um, so as far as I know, uh, that is the only one she signed um, in a Wright's work. Uh, but as I said, like, in that Wasmus portfolio, so many people go through and they say, well, this is Marion's, this is Marion's. But when she um, started working with Walter, um, she she would put, as uh, she changed her, her monogram to MG Marion Marnie Griffin. Um, so that's quite interesting because you can often tell, like with the um, drawing she did of the cooling house, that's got uh, Marion Marnie, got MMG on it. So we know that she did it after she married. Um, but then again, there's a lot of other drawings, like the one of um, uh, the one, say, of Newman College. I don't think that she specifically had her monogram on it. Mm. Um, 
Steve so, asks, um, yeah. Steve uh, says, wonderful presentation. And so he's, uh, he's, he's finishing your book right now. What inspired you most about Marion uh, that led you to write the book? Um, she was ahead of her time. Um, I liked her. Um, I liked reading uh, when I read Magic of America, which doesn't read, you don't read it from the beginning to the end. Um, it's a, a, a hodgepodge of different of letters and reflections. I liked her observations. Um, I admired her passion for the environment, um, her passion for democracy, you know, like a really thriving democracy. I like her view that, um, yeah, uh, she, she reinvented herself a lot. Uh, you know, she had to um, move to Australia where she was, you know, Mrs. Griffin. And, um, you know, being a little bit frustrated, she threw herself into, um, into the, um, to the drawings. And if anyone can ever get that book, um, uh, 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 when you read her drawings, uh, no, her writing and her descriptions of the Australian environment and the trees, so they're very rich and very um, quite amazing, actually. Um, so um, I, I just found her quite inspiring, um, and um, yeah, trying to pick together bits of of her life and pull it all together as a pattern. And you know, you look. Um, uh, it's today women are you know not as successful professionally as some of them would like, and you think, well, how hard it must have been for her to to be her. But she was very outspoken too. Um, she was, uh, she rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way. Um, but this uh, whole energy she had, um, and, but also, a, you know, a community view of the world. I mean, I think that she would like us to be here today. You know, she would like us to be doing this. Um, and, and so, you know, there's a lot of things I like about her, actually. Yeah. <laughs> John Panic uh, asked, can you speak about the design of Wright Studio and how it relates to Marion's thesis project for an artist home and studio? And is there evidence for influence on Wright's plan? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in a book, there's a book written by, edited by David Van Zanten called Marion Maney Griffin Reconsidered. Um, David is a retired professor from Northwestern and who's a Marion expert, as I acknowledge that. He's the, one of the first people to really look at her separately. Um, and in that book, there is a, um, people looked at the th her thesis at MIT and it was, um, to it was the idea was uh, uh, if you how would you design an artist home and studio and how would you um, separate the home from the studio um, and yeah so you could actually get that at MIT so you know we're not making it up sort of thing um, and and so a lot of people think that might have I mean she was working with Wright in the Steinway Hall building it might have infused his thinking I mean part of it is you've got to have two different entrances you've got the house on the corner and the office um, and how to separate the two, um, you know, sort of high, a high ceiling so you can get lots of light if you're in, in her thesis was about an artist, but obviously Wright's an architect. So um, the idea of getting lots of light coming in. So it is interesting and people have speculated in that book whether Marion was talking to Wright and, you know, um, this is the hard thing about Marion, you know, like she, how do you say what's her work and what isn't? Um, she wasn't a boastful person, but you could definitely argue there's lots of um, overtones and similar themes in what she did in her thesis, which would have been 1894, um, and Wright's um, design, which was probably 1898. Um, so separate entrances, the idea of um, perhaps a, an entrance to the office that looks good, high ceilings and the flow between the home and the um, and, and the workspace. Um, but again, you know, did Wright ever admit that, hey, you know, Marion Maney um, inspired me? No. <laughs> exactly. So uh, well, just to answer one of the questions, we will be uh, having this uh, link and we will email those that registered for this uh, link to be able to watch this later. Um, um, someone said, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. It sounded like uh, you'd said that Marion died at her granddaughter's home. Did Marion have a granddaughter? Or who's, oh, who's, who was oh, she living sorry, with? Yes, actually, yeah. very good question. Yes, sorry. Um, it was her um, sister's granddaughter. Yes, sorry. Yes, yeah, she never, they never had children. Um, yes, uh, that was right. Um, yeah, certainly wasn't her granddaughter. Um, yeah, when she came back, um, she didn't have much money. She came back from Australia to Chicago and um, she lived with her 
might have been her niece and and their children. Um, so you're right, it was not her grand. They had no direct descendants. Um, and she basically helped care for the children. Um, she um, certainly had no money. She actually had hoped there was, um, she could get some money from Australia. And those houses in Castle Craig now are million dollar houses, multi-million dollar. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, that was uh, that was wrong. She had no children. It was her her niece and her children. Yeah. Um, Bill Pardue says that uh, he's seen several uh, assessments of Mary and Mahoney Griffin in relation to Walter. Uh, one is that she recognized him as the better architect and devoted herself to promoting him, and others that she was every bit as equal but took a back seat due to the re uh, realities of the era for a woman. Uh, another is that they were co-equals. Do you have thoughts? Um, it should be remembered she's five years older than him as well. Um, and so she went to MIT, which I think um, is was a pretty good school. So you've got to say um, she's got, had a very solid, and she worked for Wright for 10, 11 years. So she's had a pretty solid background. Um, but she herself said um, there was a reception given, a, a farewell for them when they went to Australia at the Chicago, uh, Chicago architectural community. And she said, I'm just happy that, um, you know, to go and help Walter um, design, lay this city out. So she, um, she wasn't egotistical and that makes it hard. Um, she was devoted to Walter um, and she um, gave him a lot of support. Um, and I think also they had, um, were they equal? They certainly were very robust. They both she had was strong intellectually uh, but it does appear that when she worked with Walter, uh, he, um, um, I think his thoughts were dominant in some ways. Like you can see she loves stained glass windows and yet he's more these muntins. Um, so I think it was a very strong partnership. Um, and it is a pity that she uh, said herself, she was more than happy that Walter got all, all the, that Walter got all the fame. Um, and uh, it wasn't, didn't worry her that she never got fame. I think it was a very strong husband and wife partnership. Yeah, he actually admitted in a, 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 I think a article that you shared with me the other day uh, in, a, in a magazine interview, I guess shortly after the commission uh, or the, the award for the capital, that he, admired, he admitted that she was the design genius and that he was the businessman, uh, at least yeah, at that point. When he went to Australia the first time in 1913, they had then met up with some of these Australians that were in Chicago. Uh, there were two of them. They were very um, strong-minded women, and they had connections in Melbourne. So Walter met up with this particular guy who ran a magazine called Henry Hyde, anyway. And, and so, therefore, there was a little bit of a friendship link, and he actually said that she did more than me. Um, again, it's hard. The other thing to remember, when they designed Canberra, Marion, um, Walter had never left America. Marion had had a trip to Europe with her after her graduation with her brother. And she describes in Magic of America going to see Rome and in the moonlight and some of the European capitals. And so um, yeah, one of my arguments is that there's some inspiration of the, the capital, um, Capitoline Hill in Rome and some of the thoughts of, of Rome in, in the capital building uh, in the design for Australia. But um, it, yeah, that's very interesting that he said, we're talking about not long after the design, he's confiding to a friend uh, or a friend of a friend, she did most of the stuff. But again, you know, um, very hard to uh, hard to say. I mean, definitely did the drawings um, and she would have liked the idea of, um, uh, you know, the city nestled into the environment. Uh, but there's a whole other debate on, on the design of Canberra uh, of the role of this Capitol building. And it wasn't, the Capitol there wasn't like a Capitol in Washington. They were looking of it as a Capitoline Hill, which was like a public space. Um, and then I, I feel that Marion got that a bit from her trip to Rome. But I, I can't sort of, um, I can't prove it, but... Um, yeah, she she definitely um, was, uh, um, you know, was a more experienced architect than him when they were doing that, when they're doing yeah. that plan. And one of my arguments is I, I say, if it was two men and, and you had one guy was five years older, he went to a better, he was more experienced, he went to a better college, 
um, although Paul Crutty who comes who um, disputes that. But uh, I mean, you wouldn't say the younger guy did it all. Um, you know, you'd at least say it's equal. But um, in, in the you know the the architectural practice was Walter's seen as Walter's practice and. Uh, you know, Marion was in love with Walter and she married, she was an unusual woman. I don't know whether she'd had any partners before. Um, he, he, he'd fallen in love with Frank Lloyd Wright's sister, but that's another story. Um, but she was very, um, she was very pleased for Walter to get the credit. And so she, in a way, subsumed perhaps her identity to making him look good. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony asked, how much uh, did esoteric philosophy influence Marion and her design? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, she in America was a Unitarian, um, which I don't know too much about, but it's not like a, it's a more liberal kind of religion. So she ended up becoming in Australia an anthroposophist, but she didn't become that and she didn't sign up till, eight, till 1920, it was about 1930. Some people like to project anthroposophy and, and the Theophis, Theophysis movement, which was sort of around that time, they're sort of linked as, as um, influencing the design of Canberra. But technically, she had not even been interested in this sort of philosophy at that time. Uh, so I say there are people who have tried to project the um, anthroposophy and some of the designs into the design for Canberra. I don't think it's right, but when she came to Australia, um, there was a rising movement in theosophy and um, anthroposophy, which the only, I mean, Rudolf Steiner was a leading proponent of anthroposophy. So, um, but it was not until the late 20s she became involved in that. So I, I can't see um, how you can say that affected her, um, the design for Canberra, which was done in 1911. Great, thank you. And one final question, uh, Ken, from uh, Alan. Can you uh, discuss the ending, and that's in uh, quotes, of the Prairie School in India, uh, India in the 1930s, question mark, or in America, we generally say that the Prairie School ended with the World War I or shortly afterwards. Uh, any thoughts on that? Um, yes, I think they, look, the Griffins only did a few buildings in India, and um, he was designing quite different things for the Indian environment uh, and when you go to like now which I have there's really hardly anything there so um, but I think you're right and that was um, when the Griffins came back to Chicago in 1925 um, they could see that things had changed too and you can see even how Walter's um, style changed from the how you know the cool, the cooling house uh, designs he was doing when he was there to when he moved to Australia, he he evolves different. Um, so, uh, and then obviously Wright has reinvented himself many times and changed. So, I, I would say more, but yeah, Walter himself observed that that things had changed by 1925. So, I would say there's a certain style um, that probably did die, uh, or, or did come to its peak. Um, in the years before World War One, um, and, and but I do use the term prairie. I, I suppose I'm using it also in a broader philosophy. Um, but the actual designs, probably, yeah, after World War One, um, they changed. Right, changed. The Griffins changed. Others changed. The world changed. So, but yeah. but I think their their common view of the environment, uh, integrating the building with the environment. Um, what is a common thread that continued uh, after, but the building designs certainly changed. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you so much. Well, Glenda, is, is, uh, any any uh, closing thoughts or any other things that uh, we uh, that you'd like to mention uh, before we close here? Well, um, thank you for asking me, and I wish you all the best in your in your project. And I know you've been doing it for a long time. Um, and so that's what I hopefully can inspire some people, some of your supporters to realise this is part of a much bigger picture. And, you know, very interesting insight into a certain part of American history. Um, but I think the other thing, just generally, um, I think that, you know, we've all had um, two, two years of closed, um, you know, we've had the pandemic. 
uh, it's closed borders, um, it stopped people traveling. And I think it's a bit of a reminder of the importance of these projects in communities coming together. Um, and, you know, it's great that we're talking and maybe hopefully one day I'll come and see a finished Hooley House. Um, and so I think it's important of recognising your history. It's important to learn about it, to be inspired by it. And it's important to have community projects which help um, build um, communities together, as Marion would have, would herself would have wanted. Absolutely. So we look forward to hosting you at the Cooley House, either during the renovations or after or, or both. Uh, I'll so, come so after please, the work's done. please, <laughs> yes, yes, we'll come for the come for the party. So, uh, and if you anyone uh, would like to uh, learn more about the Cooley House Foundation or follow our progress, uh, the web uh, address is cooleyhouse.org. So, uh, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. Amazing, um, Glenda. Uh, thank everyone else for joining us this evening, and uh, from the Cooley House Foundation. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, for your interest. Have a good night. Thank you, and um, well, hopefully we'll meet again. <laughs>